Well, hello there, everybody. Welcome to the Adventures in Brain Injury podcast. This is a podcast for people with brains who want to optimize their brain function and to upgrade their lives. My name is Kevin Ballister. I'm a severe traumatic brain injury survivor and uh, author of How to Feed a Brain. This episode, like all the other episodes, are brought to you by feedabrain.com. Uh, go over to feedabrain.com. We have loads of, uh, of supplements and articles about nutrition and brain function and ways to increase synaptogenesis and neurogenesis and neuroplasticity in general. Um, another announcement is that I have released my audiobook of How to Feed a Brain. So you can get that on, uh, on Amazon or Audible or whatever. Amazon owns Audible. So you can get it on Amazon. And, um, and there's a sample. I actually am the one who narrated it, even though I've been diagnosed with dysarthria in the past, which is slurred speech. And I've been mistaken for being intoxicated so many times. So, yeah, check it out. If you are like me and you have trouble reading, this is amazing, which is why I really, really was adamant about recording an audiobook and getting an audiobook out there so that it can help more people. Um, some other announcements is if you are, well, I, I work with clients who often have a loved one in a situation like what I went through. Um, in a medical crisis of all sorts, usually neurological, be it a stroke or a, uh, a brain injury. Um, I also work with pediatrics. Uh, I work with children who have, have had brain injuries. I mean, I'm working with their parents in order to make change. But these, these are aspects that we need a partner going through the conventional care medical matrix, as I call it. Um, it's just nobody plans for a brain injury. Nobody really knows what to do when one happens because they don't prepare for it. And we, sh we shouldn't be preparing for something terrible to happen. Why would we want to call that in, right? But when something happens, being able to partner somebody who's been there, who's working with other professionals in that field, and who can bring their experience, their knowledge, and their connections to bring about the most, the, 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 the best possible outcome. That's what I do. So if you want to get a hold of me, go to feedabrain.com forward slash consult. Fill out the form um, and schedule with me. and Or just send me an email to uh, consult at feedabrain.com. And let's have a conversation. Um, and if you're enjoying this podcast, head over to Patreon. Consider throwing in a buck or two per episode. That really helps us continue to pump out content and get these episodes published for you guys. And if you don't have the financial means, but you're getting value out of these podcasts, um, leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play or uh, on Facebook, Feed a Brain Facebook or Adventures of Brain Injury Facebook. Both very useful and helpful in getting this information out to more people. Anyways, let's just get into this episode. I'm interviewing Dr. Deborah Zelinsky, who is just a phenomenal optometrist who I have so much respect for. Um, I mean, Dr. Zelinsky is an optometrist. And she's on the board of directors for the Society of Brain Mapping and Therapeutics. And she's a community leader for the Society for Neuroscience. She founded the Mind Eye Connection in 1992. 
and it's now become the Mind Eye Institute. And we're going to talk about the mind, the eye, the ears, just all of it. And, and more than that, how all of our sensory is connected with our eyes. And it, this is an extremely interesting episode. You're going to love it. So let's just dive into it. Here's Dr. Deborah Zelensky. Well, hello, Dr. Deborah Zelensky. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Kevin? It is so good to see you. I'm doing fantastic. And it's, it's always great to see you. I need to come out to Chicago soon. You don't want to come now. It's, per, it's cold. Yeah, I know. I don't plan to. It's, uh, how, how cold is it there right now? Oh, I don't know. This morning it was 17 or 18 degrees. Yeah. The other I, night it was 12 degrees. You don't want to come now. No, no. And I'll we're five weeks that. away from winter. And can you believe that? Wow. No. Wow. I, I love that you have my book in the background. <laughs> I love supporting you and thank you for supporting me. It's, I think you've, you're an incredible guy who's found your destiny in life. As as are you, and it, your work is just phenomenal. You know, I I spoke for the uh, the um, visual processing. What was it? It was uh, the neuroplasticity of visual processing. Is that what it was? When you spoke, where? When I spoke in Chicago with uh, oh, Kevin yeah. Pierce. The neuro, yes, the neuro, neuroplasticity of visual processing. Yes, 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 that was fantastic. And mm -hmm. we got to spend some time. Um, we got to spend some time together then. And thinking back, the first time I met you was in 2014 when I was the keynote speaker for the Neurooptometric Rehabilitation Association. Mm -hmm. And you gave such a moving speech. It was incredible. The whole audience was in tears. Oh, thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was that, you know, up there, that's, that's where my, my entire purpose really solidified. And it really like, was like, yes, this is absolutely what I'm here to do. That's when you were busy studying the Krebs cycle. You're at the yeah. beginning of all your feet of brain stuff. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Well, you remember, and I was talking about the cranial nerves yes. and how one third of our cranial nerves, what is it, uh, four out of 12 cranial nerves innervate the eye and mm -hmm. actually are dedicated to vision. And well, actually, it's more than that. So, Well, there's, there, it's half of them that innervate. Mm -hmm. Four are absolutely dedicated, like they don't do anything else, is my understanding. But yeah. one half of them innervate. And then also, there's all sorts of connections, right? And yeah. the name of your, uh, of, of your company is the Mind Eye Institute. Yes. So, um, and you, you talk about the connections of everything to our visual system, which is so on point because if we want to see how the brain's functioning we look at the eyes and if we want to affect neuroplastic change we do it through the eyes to well, that's because the eye is actually part of the brain it is yeah so we were for 25 years called the mind eye connection mm -hmm. and now we've become the mind eye institute so we can start getting into research showing how the retina is a part of the central nervous system and when we put glasses on, we're affecting the entire body. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And I've noticed that as well um, mm -hmm. in my own recovery is how like, like since having your glasses, my, since, since you prescribed lenses after doing a diagnostic on me and, and doing more than just visual testing, well, you know what, let's start with this. Mm -hmm. I used to have 2020 vision. Mm -hmm. and you know, I still am pretty good on my acuity. Why is, is, uh, well, tell me about eye examinations and your idea of like what conventional eye examinations are and how, 
how effective they are in helping people with their vision? Well, 2020 concept was developed to standardize optometry. And that was done in 1862, before cars were invented. And it was designed so that uh, you could look at a stationary target, like a letter on a wall, and identify it clearly. So it was all based on clear and blurry. So a conventional eye exam covers one eye, blocks off the side of the other eye. You look through a little hole, and they say, which is better, one or two? And you look for clear and blurry. And then after that, they do the other eye, and you look straight ahead. Then they look at the eye health to make sure your eyes are healthy and that they're not paralyzed. But there's not a lot done on awareness and attention. So a lot of it's hmm, the standard eye exams go more on aiming and focusing. But aiming, people don't aim their eyes unless they're aware of something to aim at. And they don't focus their eyes unless they're paying attention to something. You know, you could just stare off into space. Like I could stare right now at you, but be thinking about what I'm having for dinner. And so I'm not focused on any details. If I choose to aim and focus on you, then my eyes point and zoom in focus. Mm -hmm. Um, But the standard conventional eye exams test aiming and focusing, but not so much with what's going on on the side. That's when I had the little slide that I sent you. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I was going to say, how how much of our vision is just looking at a stationary target and, you know, deciding what that is? like? Well, in the year 2020, it's going to be very little because uh, when you're driving, you use peripheral eyesight more. When you're reading, you're busy looking at the shapes and the words and where you are. You don't look so much at the tiny details. Um, when you're playing sports, there's a lot of moving targets. Um, uh, most people use their peripheral eyesight a lot uh, to help guide and navigate. So when you're just walking and talking to somebody, your peripheral eyesight is turned on to make sure you don't fall in a pothole or you see a curb. So the peripheral eyesight is turned on all day long, but it's at a subconscious level. And so when you're at an eye, eye test in a do test your peripheral eyesight, they test it at a conscious level. And they say, hey, you know, look straight ahead, tell me when you see my fingers wiggling. So your peripheral eye test is done, but it's done at a conscious level, not subconscious. And but we use it subconsciously. So just because it exists, doesn't mean we use it. Right. And uh, what, what, you know, let's, let's take a look at that, that, uh, the image that you sent me. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to pull that up. Let's see. I'm going to share my screen. And yeah, so here it is. 94% of surrounding information is not where conscious attention is. Mm-hmm. And uh, Patrick Quaid, tell me about him. Uh, he's an optometrist who does research in Canada uh, near Toronto uh, in Guelph, I think. So. Um, Actually, so uh, Patrick has done some experiment and shown that uh, 80, oh, that's you, uh, that about 6% of your eyesight is on the letters that you're looking at, and the other 94% is your peripheral awareness. So what's drawn in blue here, the pale blue, that's your conscious awareness. And what's drawn in green is the subconscious awareness. Mm. But what's that little white dot? That's your central eyesight. That's when you're looking at the letter target. That's a standard eye exam. And why, why would people be so interested in only 6% of what you're seeing? Because that 6% carries one, it, it, it triggers 1 million pieces of information through your brain. But the other huge amount, the 94%, that only has 200,000 pieces of information. So I, I talk a lot about pretending it's like Wyoming, where it's a giant state with very few people in it, and compare that to Washington, D.C. That's a much smaller location, but jam-packed with people. Mm-hmm. So there, you know, if you pretended like there's 1 million people in D.C., but there's 200,000 in the state of Wyoming, it's, that's how 
the sees in the eye, the retina sends signals. You have the peripheral part and the central part. If the central part is engaged, it sends a lot of signals, but it's the peripheral part that tells the central part to point and focus. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you taught me this term, the sensory diet, uh -huh. which, which I, uh, I, I know someone else coined. Yes. Um, and, and that whole idea has taken off in my mind and has been so much of my work recently, especially in my, writing my new book. Mm -hmm. um, my next book, but uh, but what we perceive is far more than vision. So you did a test with me um, called the Z Bell test. Can you tell me about that? Yeah. Uh, well, I invented a test back in 1992, and it got patented much more recently um, to locate sounds. The point is that people use their eyes and ears together all the time. And you use it for what now, looking at Skype like you and I are doing now. Uh, you'll use it for uh, social skills, for academics. You need to watch and listen at the same time. And uh, people are testing eyes and they're testing ears, but they're not testing the interaction between them. And if that interaction is disrupted, like after a brain injury, or if the interaction never had developed properly. It's like eye-ear coordination is like hand-eye coordination. So hand-eye coordination develops from childhood onward. And uh, there's a researcher in Italy named Monica Gori, and she's done tremendous amounts of research on ear-eye connections and determined that they don't solidify until you're eight years old. So when you have children who don't have good, solid eye-ear connections, they're not going to succeed in school as easily or we're, have as many social skills. Right. And we were talking about um, just recently working with a client that, uh, that we both have uh, partaken in. We, we talked about the eye vestibular and the ear vestibular and how yeah. they all work in together. So how no understanding how, when we feel something, and sound is occurring, especially bass like driven sound like mm -hmm. those are those are related yeah. and how how yeah and and sound and you know when you said sensory diet also, I think that you know I was taught in school we have five senses, mm -hmm. and i I know for a fact that we have far more than five senses, right. Mm -hmm. We have five from the outside, you know, that, that are in this, this, this five senses, like your eyes, seeing, hearing, taste, and touch, all those. Mm -hmm. Those are from your somatosensory nervous system. Right. But there's tons of other senses that go into other nervous systems. Right. Vestibular, proprioception, like there's, there's a lot more. And even, you know, energetically, mm -hmm. which basically is, is another word for like, we don't have a way to measure this right now mm -hmm. even if we do have a way to measure it you know a lot of it with like electromagnetic fields and stuff like that but like if, if i walk into a room where mm -hmm. people have been arguing okay and they're like hey hi and they're pretending they weren't mm -hmm. i can feel that right and and everybody else can feel that you can you can sense when people are being uh disingenuous and you can sense the tension in the air and things of that sort mm -hmm. and i think the like this is what i really love about the z-bell tests and and can i can i uh give our audience a little rundown of of what you were doing with me oh sure and we use different tones it. because one the lower tones sure. for vestibular the higher tone is for cognitive so sure perception nice, nice. yeah so you would ring a bell. Mm -hmm. um, I would have my eyes closed, and you would mm -hmm. put a lens over my closed eyes. Mm -hmm. Well, first there would be no lens, and you'd you'd ring the bell, mm -hmm. and and my job would be to keep my eyes closed and touch wherever I think it is. So I'm localizing where something is based on my my audio presumably without my eyes mm -hmm. 
But as you demonstrated, then you would put a lens over my closed eyes and you'd ring the bell mm -hmm. and maybe I would hit it, right? Okay. And and then you'd put like different different filters on there as well and maybe to get more accurate, right? Mm -hmm. And and um you would use different different tones as you were saying for vestibular yeah and that sort of, but using this entire localization of somebody's sensory diet hmm. you know especially with the eye ear connection it was it's so powerful well it is i mean i i discovered that in 1992 because once i found i i found that putting glasses on people altered where they perceived sounds and then i'd have patients and i'd say i would do the classic standard exams which is better one or two and they would say i don't know they look about the same and then i'd say well let me see what you find with the bell and i would close their eyes and have them try to reach the bell and one pair of glasses they couldn't find it and the other pair they could find it easily so i thought well you're saying you don't see a difference one one which is better one or two you don't see a difference but with number one you can't find the bell with number two your ears are working great you find the bell so i would give them whichever one they hit the bell and then people were coming back to me and saying wow these are the most comfortable glasses i've ever had and That's so amazing. i just kept doing that for year after year 23 years later i figured out how what was happening <laughs> because I had different combinations it took 23 years to figure out it was the lighting that made a difference and everybody fit into two categories some people got better in bright light and some people got worse in bright light and so then it took another couple of years to figure out what the filters were doing and now we've been doing a lot more research on actually brain mapping so the retina itself right. is is mapped into the brain and when you stimulate different areas of it you get different chemical reactions so there's oh. studies yeah, there's studies that show like melatonin uh, normally in the brighter light dopamine is produced and in the dimmer light melanopsin is expressed which eventually turns into melatonin but they found that it's only part of the retina that does that not all of it hmm. yeah i also want to thank you for inviting me to the world brain mapping uh, conference last year um, and with with Dr. Babak Katab, phenomenal, and I got to meet. Um, you met Eric Kandel. Yeah, I got to meet Eric Kandel, Nobel yeah. Nobel Prize. Nobel Prize Lord, the guy who did the Brain series on Charlie uh, Rose. Amazing, yeah. yes, yes, yes. I was I was I was a bit starstruck. It mm -hmm. was amazing. <laughs> kind of felt like a neurology nerd. That makes sense. I'm kind of a neurology nerd, you know? Well, you're, you're on that roundtable discussion and we yeah, had. Yeah, it was amazing. I need to put that on my website. Yeah. You know what? I'm, I'm going to put that in the show notes for sure, um, that roundtable discussion that we had there. Yeah. Um, yes, it's, it's, so, it's so cool just thinking that with our eyes closed, lenses still are affecting our perception of the world yeah. and and i mean my my experience you know i would i have had i i wear a prism right um and and different diopters like keep on moving down in diopters i mean i was originally diagnosed needing a nine diopter prism Mm -hmm. And now I believe I'm I'm about a four or five split. Well, prisms come in different flavors, though. Like like I tell people all the time, they're like shoes. You can have army boot type of prisms, or spiked heel type of prisms, or flip flops, or or gym shoes. They're all different kinds of prisms. So it, you can't just say I had nine units and now I'm four because your nine units could have been one type of prism, and your four units could be a completely different type of prisms. And some are the types that you get habituated to, and some are the types you don't. Some change your shoulders, some change your hips. So they're they're different. So it's it doesn't it's it's not 
I have prism and it's nine diopters. It, that doesn't work. It's um, not enough. It's a little, little more finesse than that, right? It's like Just different, different style. Yeah, and and this is what's in my experience um, throughout my my time of rehabilitating and seeing different optometrists mm -hmm. until I saw you. Like my, my eyes uh, just, just existing was exhausting, you know, mm -hmm. because your eyes require so much attention and so, and then so much brain power, right? Mm -hmm. Again, uh, four of your cranial nerves are directly, directly innervate the visual system and half of your cranial nerves are connected and likely more are affecting that the the visual system as well mm -hmm. so vision your brain takes up more energy it's the most energy hungry part of the body and it's only like two pounds of your body yeah, but it's got trillions of connections it does it has trillions of connections and that's mm -hmm. that's why lots of activity going on up there Mm -hmm. And so it uses an enormous amount of energy. And the fact is I would get exhausted. And I, I mean, I still get, get tired mm -hmm. um, from, from intense visual stimuli, especially scrolling and being on Facebook or Instagram or whatever. Like those destroy me. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, it's really amazing what your lenses have done for me. As far as my resilience and my energy. Well, thank you. Thank you. Know, we hear that all you. the time. Thank you, yeah. Debbie. I, I mean, it's really given me so much more ability to help others. Mm -hmm. And no, I, I, I truly appreciate you so much for, for your work and your genius and like what you put into this. Because, you know, at the beginning of this interview, you were saying, that I've found my calling. Well, mm -hmm. you certainly have found yours and you are helping so many people and I'm just extremely appreciative of you. Thanks. I think I see things differently. Like I think I just, when I, when I put lenses on people, I don't think of it in terms of numbers. Like it's not just a one or a two or a three. It's how it changes the space around the person. So I, I think with the math background that I have, um, I can just, I picture more like a video going on. So I put a lens in front of somebody and I can see things expand and constrict and move and tilt. And uh, it's just, it's, it's looking at things through a mathematical viewpoint mm. uh, rather than a science one. Mm. Yeah. So and it, you, you, you have an interesting story about your upbringing and how your, your strength in, in math. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm a math geek through and through. But, tell me a little uh, bit about uh, how you grew up and the difficulties you had uh, um, growing well, up and the strength you had. Uh, well, I had uh, I learned how to read when I was little, but then uh, at some point I stopped being able to read comfortably. Now, as a grown up, if I'm looking back, it was after I got hit in the head with a croquet mallet. So, but I didn't realize that. That'll do. And then, and then I stopped uh, reading. And from then forward, from being a small grammar school kid till college, my reading comprehension was always horrific. Um, never could understand what the written words said. Couldn't write essays, couldn't read easily. If I did read, it would be reading out loud to myself or having somebody else read on a tape and then listen to it. Then I saw double in college. So, you know, the doctors in college told me that you know, I had multiple sclerosis because why else does an 18-year-old get double vision? And, uh, but it wasn't. It was that I had a visual processing problem. Um, so I just went into math because I could do the math in my head. I never had to read books. You could just hear the teachers talk, make it up in your head. Um, I could multiply, divide. I had a little mental blackboard. So, yeah, it was very easy. Um, I come from a mathematical family. And that's, you know, everything I did was math puzzles. So I think they have that 10,000-hour that, uh, rule, that if you get 10,000 hours in something, it makes you better at it. 
So I've got plenty of uh, hours and hours of solving math puzzles. Mm. And that's and what I do every day here. You say, hmm? you say you have a mental blackboard. Yeah. Meaning that you visualize the the problems in your your mental blackboard you you write it out you have all that and, well it, um, it writes out itself i remember right. walking home with a friend of mine when i was in fifth grade and we were talking about something in math and i said well just look at your blackboard and she's like what blackboard and i said well the, the one that tells you the answers and, and she didn't know what i meant and i didn't know that she didn't have one because it was so, but i could just you could just throw anything in my head and I could see it just forming and coming up with the solution. So the equations would just solve themselves. Mm -hmm. And then when calculators came out, people would race me and I could multiply three by two digits in my head quicker than anybody could punch it on a calculator because yeah. it would just fly it. Like it was as if somebody was handwriting everything and you'd get the answer written right in front of you. Mm -hmm. So I would just be like reading the answers. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, my head did some pretty wild things your, with numbers. Your head's amazing, and and I mean, I've seen you work, and it, it looks kind of scattered, and like, like there's 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 stuff kind of scattered around it from the outside. It looks that way, but you know where everything is, and you have like, like I mean, you've been compared to, to a mad scientist because you just. You rock it, Debbie, and like it looks so disorganized, but you just you come with these amazing you know, just your results are phenomenal. One of my patients said that I'm weird in a smart, nerdy way, and she said, But smart and nerdy is the new cool and trendy. <laughs> I totally agree, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, all right, we're talking about IEAR connections. And are people born with IEAR connections or do they develop? Uh, they're born with a reflex connection. So a brand new baby, if something drops on one side, the baby will turn their head. That's a reflex. But to learn the, uh, the nuances and, and smaller things, uh, no, then, then they have to develop it. Okay. So. And how can they... Um, be disrupted. Uh, we can disrupt it from an emotional trauma or a physical trauma um, or something like you get a two-year-old who's not very developed at eye ear connections and you put a really fun computer program in front of them where they push buttons and they look and then it makes noises. So if the two-year-old's eyes and ears are not quite connected, then they will, they'll pick, I like the sounds or I like the sights but they can't do both at the same time. And so they'll play with the toy, but they'll, they'll listen or they'll watch it. And then when they get older and go to school, those are the kids that would have trouble, if they're the auditory kids, they have trouble with sight words. If they're the visual kids, they have trouble with phonetic, uh, phonetic spelling of words. Hmm. So it's, um, it's, it's a double-edged sword. It's nice to give little kids computer programs to help them learn, but they learn better if they go through you know, hand-eye coordination and auditory games separate from visual games and then some visual integration. But it still takes them a long time. Okay. And so if, if a kid or an adult has an eye-ear disconnect, what are some ways that we can rehabilitate that? Uh, well, there's proprioceptors that will change. So just feet position. Uh, changes uh, how you process sounds and sights. Um, so it's, some kids have retained primitive reflexes and they need reflex work. Um, other kids need glasses. Even if they're 20-20 in the center of their eye, they still need glasses for the periphery part. Um, other kids just need a lot of practice of eye-ear connections, games. Uh, because for reading, you need to learn sounds and letters and how the two work together that you can that reading is actually just looking at a bunch of letters which are representing sounds and the sounds are representing words that you've heard mm -hmm. and right. little kids don't always know that so i just recently released my audiobook mm -hmm. and audiobooks have been so important for me because because 
I don't like reading. And honestly, I never really did like reading. In fact, mm-hmm. um, Dr. Dr. Zelensky, different Zelensky, Dr. Mm-hmm. Glenn Zelensky at Northwest Functional Neurology in Portland, Oregon. Mm-hmm. Um, no relation, but an excellent functional neurologist. He's like, he did a VNG on me, and he's looking at the results, and he's looking at me, and he's looking at the results, and he's looking at me, and he goes, dude, how did you write a book? <laughs> I'm like, very carefully? I don't know. He's mm-hmm. like, he's like, you don't scroll vertically. Facebook mm-hmm. and Instagram must kill you. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. He's like, your brain just gives up, right? Mm-hmm. And um, and that's that's something that that I'm working on. And at the same time, audiobooks are such an ally to me. Like mm-hmm. I I really love having audiobooks and being able to use technology to to speak words to me. Mm-hmm. So um so th- and these these are crutches. Um they're also, you know, they're they're very useful crutches. Crutches are very useful. Um but they're not something to rely on forever. Mm-hmm. Right? So right. so um you know, and I'm an adult and you've you've given me some some glasses. And I know I we need to, I need to come in and we need to need to move things forward on these, but um, but what's really interesting is that what you did is just in well not just but what one of the main things you did was include the ear mm-hmm. in your in your eye exam and because. I, if you get glasses that don't uh, that don't check it, and you just get glasses where the eyes are good, you don't know if it messes up the auditory or not. Right, mm-hmm. and I think this can be standardized into mm-hmm. eye exams everywhere. Mm-hmm. So, and but Mind Eye Mind Eye Institute is busy training optometrists as we speak. Is Our right. first satellite office is opening up in the western suburbs of Chicago. And we have uh, two, one doctor fully trained, one doctor partially trained, and we're putting together a training manual. We're setting up a fellowship program. So uh, Mind Eye Institute will be doing that. Nice, nice. Mm-hmm. I am so excited about that because it is so needed in order to give people actual, you know, I mean, you've said this. Mm-hmm. Let's leave 2020 in the 20th century. Because it was invented in the 19th century, yeah. Ah, that's awesome. And it's the uh, the neat thing is that the the eye exam it's just ready for an update. It's 155 years old, or 158 yeah. years old, and it's just ready for an update, the next step to enhance it. And it's more important for brain injury patients or children with learning disabilities or genetic disorders or patients with conditions like POTS, because if you sharpen their eyesight too much but you distort that peripheral aspect then their their nervous system is uncomfortable and stress chemicals are produced mm-hmm. when the stress chemicals are produced they feel bad mm-hmm. you got to get a how you feel comfortable before you start being aware of the surroundings and pay attention to things that's so true. How you feel is probably the most important thing to to how you perform in this world, you know? Now, one of the things is, all I mean, I learned everything that I know from Dr. Albert Sutton, and he learned everything he knew from uh, Dr. Skeffington. So there's a lot of doctors, Bruce Wolf and John Streff and uh, Brian Holden. There's so many doctors and researchers that have you know come before all i did was add in the the auditory piece of it i think it's a critical piece but it's in this, it's um it's the next piece in optometry i believe i and absolutely I'm, agree i'm now on the board of directors for the brain mapping association and the interesting thing there is i'll go to some place like the society for neuroscience 
and learn all the brand new retinal research and then bridge the gap between the doctors who don't know enough about retinal processing and me who doesn't know enough about the body functions. So you have to have, somebody has to bridge the gap. All the researchers are using animals. They're using mice and ferrets and rabbits and monkeys and pigs, you know, and we're using humans. Every time we put glasses on somebody, we're altering brain function in humans. And the researchers can't. They're not allowed to use humans until they've gone through all the ranks of mice up through monkeys. And so somebody's got to take it. The, the classic term in research is called from bench to bedside. So they, the bench, they, they're figuring stuff out. But then the bedside is where optometrists and other practitioners work. Mm-hmm. And it sounds to me like you're going bedside. Mm-hmm. Just you know, right away because it's safe and it's effective. Yes. And then and then showing that in research, mm-hmm. and and building up this means to change practice. And I love that that um, that you're working with the brain mapping convention. Um, the the what is it? The World Brain Mapping. Yeah, it's WorldBrainMapping.org. Uh-huh. But, but for the year 2020, which is in a few months, uh, we'll be doing something with, I, I'm in charge of 15 speakers out of their 600 speakers. Beautiful. And the, I mean, the 600 speakers are going to be from around the world, all about brain. Uh, and there's, there's space medicine for the astronauts, and there's uh, uh, neurodegenerative diseases, and there's brain injury, and there's military medicine, many different aspects. They're also adding spinal cords into it. So it's not just the brain brain and the spinal cord. And the next year, they're thinking of doing retina and the spinal cord and brain because all of that's the central nervous system. But Beautiful. my point was that for my 15 speakers, we have three groups of five. And one group of five is going to be the research, the brand new research in the retina. Like they're finding now that the retina changes before the brain in brain injury. You'll get retinal changes or for disease processes, you'll see it in certain spots in the retina before it gets deeper into the brain. There's scans for Alzheimer's. There's, scan, there's so much that goes on in the retina. You can scan to predict strokes, many things. Um, so five people on retinal research and then five people on uh, diagnosing things, what the new eye exams of the 21st century should look like. And one is going to talk about reaction time. One is going to talk about um, auditory, needing to link in there. One's going to be about um, the peripheral awareness shrinking and expanding, depending on attention and mood. So many different things. And then the other group of five, the last group, is going to be on the quality of life and how visual processing affects that. So I have a lawyer who specializes in traumatic brain injury. I have an emergency medical uh, doctor, um, emergency medicine. I have um, a a therapist who works with patients directly when they get new glasses. Um, And we have two other practitioners. Oh, we have a chiropractor uh, who does uh, kinetic movements and shows how vision is very important for that. Um, And then a fifth one. So. Oh, beautiful. And when is that convention? That's in March, uh, the 20th through the 22nd. Beautiful. Okay. And um, last time I saw you, I also uh, met Dr. Clark Elliott. Mm -hmm. Um, Ghost in my brain. And um, there is a Facebook group. Mm-hmm. Called the Ghost of My Brain Facebook group, yeah. and um, and are you fairly active on that? Um, I, I'm yes, I am. It's there's 900 and something members. It's uh, Clark Elliott is one of the most incredible people I've met in my life. Um, he is his destiny is to help people not suffer as much from their brain injuries. So he has gone around to different places promoting his book. And I think the last time I talked to him, he said there were about 14 million viewers that had 
either been you know on the radio shows or the television shows that's how many viewers from the various tv stations and radio stations and newspapers um, but he's teaching people that there is hope I mean, he had eight years of no hope at all and what you met him, he, he called you from part of the Lazarus Club because you came back from the dead. Mm. And there's so many people that have read his book and are just suffering beyond belief. And a lot of them, uh, we put glasses on to link eyes and ears. And then we work with other practitioners. Clark's book, The Ghost in My Brain, also spoke highly of Donnelly Marcus, who's doing a more neuroplasticity work. And, and doing what she calls cognitive restructuring. And between her cognitive puzzles and rehearsal of using new brain pathways and building new brain pathways, and my glasses that um, were based on what I've learned from optometrists plus the auditory, um, he fully recovered from mm -hmm. something that nobody thought he could recover from. I mean, you're the same way. You were told what 90% chance you'd wake up out of a coma, that you'd stay in a coma, and if you woke up, you'd be a vegetable. You don't look like much of a vegetable. So. <laughs> I love my life. I love my life so much. And, um, and yeah, absolutely. And Clark's amazing. Part of the Lazarus Club, yes, both mm -hmm. of us. Um, and I'll, I'll put his, a link to his book in the show notes as well. He describes symptoms, his symptoms of a brain injury so well and so vividly and in such a way that so many people can relate. And then yeah. his journey of, of overcoming these difficulties. And I have loads and loads of respect for him as well. Yeah. Actually, I need, I need to reach out to Clark. So he's, he's just an incredible human being. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he is. And he's in Chicago as well, right? He's in Chicago, yes. It's too cold right now. I'll make <laughs> it out there eventually. <laughs> it's like next June. I don't think we see nice weather till June. Yeah, all right, next June then. I'll be out there in June. All right. We'll make that happen. Well, where can people uh, learn more about you? Uh, well, we're, uh, you can go to the website at www.mindeye.com. Mm-hmm. And I also want to say that you are on my website as a supporter and ally. Mm -hmm. I absolutely support your your mission, your work, everything you're doing. And I, uh, as I said in the beginning of this, and I appreciate your support of my work. Mm -hmm. And you know, um, the 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 presentation I gave back in 2014. Mm -hmm. was about synergistic therapies. Yes. How therapies done together are greater than the sum of their parts. Mm -hmm. And bringing that to the work that, that you and I are doing and Clark's doing and Donnelly Marcus and everybody else, that's a piece of the puzzle here. It's a piece of the puzzle. And when it comes together, it's mm -hmm. synergistic. Together, we are so much stronger than, than the sum of our parts. I agree with you. But then even within the pieces, like at Mind Eye, our whole team is necessary because they, they say it takes a village. I mean, we have mm -hmm. optical people, we've got front desk people, we got patient advocates, we've got you know, other doctors, we've got the administration. And without that team, Mind Eye wouldn't be anything. So it's been very nice to have such a supportive team. Uh, as we grow and change the viewpoint of eye exams for the future. Yes. I keep telling people, you know, when, when you, uh, you know, you'll see an 18 year old, it's like when you grow up a little more and you get married and then you have a kid, by that time your kid will go to school and it'll be commonplace to have an eye test and ear test and an eye ear connection test. And you'll know how that started. Yes. Yes. Well, as always, let me know however I can support you. And is, is there anything else you'd like to announce to our audience? Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, no, that they pay, they go to worldbrainmapping.org to yeah. see what the brain mapping is doing with Washington, with policies, 
uh, because they're actually writing policies for the government leaders. Uh, one of their missions is to not have people duplicate efforts. So if U.S. is spending millions of dollars in research on Alzheimer's and Italy is spending millions of dollars and France is spending, we should all put together our, our, and collaborate because the collaboration leads to bigger ideas. That's um, right. Also, sfn.org, the Society for Neuroscience. Uh, there's, I, there's, I'm a community leader for something called Neuro Online. And uh, Neuro Online is uh, it's kind of a Facebook, but it's for scientists. So when you start getting involved there, you can write questions and get answers. Uh, so I put a blog out um, about retinal processing and you know, all the new things that come out and how it would apply to everyday life. But for the viewers, um, is you know check out like you said the Ghost in My Brain uh, Facebook page, and if you have a traumatic brain injury, uh, you, it's you'd be amazed at how many people would be just like you. Um, and then if you have a child with a learning problem at all, uh, consider their eyes and ears not being linked together. Mm, absolutely, yeah, yeah, and. Uh you know, I I know people all over the world are, are seeking you out mm -hmm. um, because of the results you're getting um, and the work you're doing. And I am so glad you're training uh, so many others and teaching the amazing work you're doing. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, Debbie. It's always such a pleasure to have you. Oh, well, thank you, field. Kevin. Yeah. Can't wait to see you in Chicago. Yep, June, June. Well, yeah, this is, well, if you want warm weather, you got to come in June. All right, we're, we're not warm until then. Yeah. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, thank you so much, Debbie. That was amazing. That was amazing. I mean, she is one of the most brilliant people I know, and it is just amazing to work with her to be in contact with her, and to be moving the needle on neural rehabilitation with her because her work is phenomenal. And you mark my words right now, she is going to change the standard eye exam with and incorporate sound. That will happen. And Dr. Deborah Zelensky will be a huge piece of changing that, if not the piece that changes that. So if you like this episode, uh, head over to iTunes, leave us a review. It really, really, really helps us reach more people. And, um, and consider supporting us. I have a page on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash AIBI for adventures and brain injury. Throw us a buck or two per episode. It really makes a difference in, in helping us cover the costs so we can get this out there and we can produce more episodes. Um, so head over there. Again, I do consultations. So if you or a loved one have sustained a brain injury, I work with people who have a loved one in a coma to people who have recovered from a brain injury and are looking to take their experience to the next level and complete the hero's journey and start paying their fortune forward. I work with people all along that spectrum. So if you'd like to have a conversation with me, send me an email, consult at feedabrain.com or fill out the form at feedabrain.com forward slash consult and schedule a conversation with me um i would i would i love working with people because this is how we change the conventional care medical matrix i mean working with clients i work with clients and we were able to circumvent the standard of care which as you may know is defined as the type and level of care an ordinary prudent healthcare professional with the same level of training experience would provide under similar circumstances 
in the same community. And right now, the way it's set up, if a physician deviates from the ordinary, same, similar standard of care, they're liable to be sued. So I teach people how to get around that and how to get the treatment they choose. And then what is the best treatment for them in their unique situation? So reach out to me. Let's change the world. One brain injury, one neurodegenerative condition, one stroke, whatever at a time. And let's improve neuro rehabilitation. Other things, I think, I think that's good. We're good. Thank you guys so much. I can't even express how appreciative of I am of each and every one of you. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I guess again, my audiobook is now available, so pick that up. And I will see you guys next time. Adios and thank you again and again. Someone take me to a doctor.